next, you know, anytime we have success stories in the metastatic setting, like we've had with TDM1 and pertuzumab, we very rapidly start thinking about moving those into the early stage setting to see if we can replicate those big gains in the curative intent setting. And so both pertuzumab and now TDM1 have moved into that space. Do you want to review a little bit about the Affinity trial? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, Affinity was really in uh, the curative space and looked at you know, the addition of pertuzumab to trastuzumab compared to trastuzumab alone, obviously in combination with chemotherapy. And what we saw was obviously that pertuzumab uh, added something. And particularly this looked like um, it was mostly in patients that were higher risk as defined by patients that had um, lymph node positive disease. There was a, an update recently about the six year uh, data from pertuzumab and this really looked quite, uh, quite impressive. 28% reduction in the risk of disease or death. And so the absolute benefit was about four and a half percent. With longer follow-up, we see this regardless of hormone receptor status. So this is whether patients are ERPR positive or ERPR negative, as long as they uh, express HER2. And we did see fewer deaths on the arm that were receiving pertuzumab, um, but this did not reach statistical significance yet and is a little bit immature in follow-up. Yeah, I think that in the HER2 positive neoadjuvant and adjuvant spaces, we've seen this divergence where the very early lymph node negative, small lymph node negative tumors, T1 and zeros, we are thinking more and more about how we could get away with less. And in the lymph node positive um, or larger tumor size T2, N1 uh, diseases, we are thinking about strategies to add on to try to continue to improve those already impressive survival outcomes, but just continuing to try to move more and more patients into that curative um, setting. And so, you know, I think that optimal patient selection really has a huge role in the way that these studies are being designed. And in Affinity, you know, it's just important to know that, again, like you, you alluded to, most of those patients were lymph node positive or had T2 tumors. And I think that that represents how I've incorporated the use of neoadjuvant or adjuvant pertuzumab into my patient population. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to, I won't spoil anything. We're going to talk about Catherine a little bit later and kind of how that may um, make us think about at least adjuvant pertuzumab a little bit differently. Um, Certainly, I think, you know, very much the standard for our high-risk patients, um, pertuzumab is available as the so-called TCHP regimen in the neoadjuvant setting for anyone that has at least a two centimeter tumor or is lymph node positive. Um, You know, I think you bring up a really good point. And, um, you know, sometimes finding the right words to kind of express this idea of what we're really trying to get at is hard. Um, We often use the goal of um, the the terminology of escalating therapy or de-escalating therapy, but that's not quite right. It's really about finding the right size treatment for the patient and their individual risk factors. And so, you know, I think it's really, um, you know, a situation of riches right now in HER2 positive disease. You know, we're at the point now that if we kind of get our hands on somebody in the early stage setting with HER2 positive disease, even if they're lymph node positive, upwards of 90% of those patients are cured. And so I think you're right. I think it's a time where we start thinking, you know, are, are there some patients that we're over treating and how can we pick that right size treatment for each patient to optimize their outcome, but also not give them more side effects than they need from their therapy. 